motivational talk, so it's the opposite, uh, frustrating thing. But before I get started, uh, first three quick questions to the audience. So who works as a data scientist in here? Yes, quite many. And who works as a data scientist outside of academia? The last one, who of you claimed that he works or worked on a machine learning project that really went into production and generates business benefit, maybe even measurable? Okay, still quite some. Maybe that's obsolete, <laughs> <laughs> so we can stop here. <laughs> but still, uh, I will try to go through that as well. Um, but it's, it's mainly about this thing, about uh, getting things into operation, what has to be so I'm Gianmarco Baschini and I'm working as a data scientist at Zuke, who's a service provider also in the field of data analytics and machine learning. And I've done quite many projects with different customers and some of them went really good, some went bad. And I want to share my experience on this today with you. So we learn mo mostly from failures, so we'll focus on the things that went bad and very specifically on one problem. And that is what is described as, uh, yeah, what is, can be frustrating, um, that you're given a task, build a predictive model for something, you get some data, uh, maybe get some snapshots out of databases, um, start cleaning the data, preparing the data, start analyzing it, build predictive models, validate them, you see, hey, you have really good scores, you have great, uh, good, great predictive power, you present results, but then things are not getting over. That's something that for me is very frustrating. It's a fun part to do, these kind of cool concepts, but um, in the end I want to work on things that somehow have the chance to get operationalized. So to put what I've just said a bit into context, I want to briefly uh, have a look at the data analytics process. That's a process I presented last year, so maybe some of you will recognize it. And I just will briefly recap the main four phases. That's uh, the vision and scope phase in the top left corner, uh, which is about ideation, uh, idea creation, and specifying use cases. Then you have evaluate and prototype, where you try as quickly as possible to validate that uh, your approach is feasible, that you can build these models. Then you have model and build, where you actually build the entire application around it and also operationalize the uh, data pipeline, etc. And then you have the life phase, where you maintain your application and also extend it. So what I've just described before, by you're given a task, you start collecting the data, getting access to the data, you clean it, do the modeling and present it, that's pretty much evaluate the prototype. That's a proof of concept. And we see this very, very often. This is done very often. We go to customers and have done a couple of talks, but not much uh, get operationalized. So currently everybody's doing some machine learning or data analytics talk, but not many run machine learning applications. And one of the main reasons that we believe that this takes place, that this happens, that things are stopped very often here, is that there are flaws in the vision and scope phase, that this hasn't been done properly. And today I will focus on this phase and try to talk about what should be considered in this phase and uh, how we normally do it. So to understand what we have to consider in this phase, I want to briefly introduce another framework, uh, which displays the different layers of a data analytics solution. So at the very top, you have the strategic goals, like data-driven, fact-based uh, decision-making, uh, or process optimization, or innovation of any other kind, you know, in business models in the service. The next level are the actual use cases, um, kind of like data-driven pricing, predictive maintenance, etc. So this is really on, on the business side, that what is the use case that we're pursuing? And to succeed in such a use case, you have four more layers below which we have to address. So I walk through them the way the data flows, at the very bottom there are the data sources, like uh, production and enterprise data, or social media, etc. So there are different data sources you can uh, connect to. The next level is the data platform layer. So that's where we store the data and process the data. It can be classical, relational databases, data warehouses, it can run in the cloud, or all the new distributed 
storage and processing uh, technologies, big data, NoSQL world, R, stream processing, etc. So that's really the platform where we can operationalize it. The next layer, that's the algorithm layer. That's the most fun part for data scientists, is machine learning and statistics, where we build this predictive model. And at this place, we pretty much have predictive model, maybe on the laptop, showing good predictive power, but it still doesn't provide any benefit to the business yet. So that's the last part uh, that you need some sort of application this intelligent model lives in. It can be as simple as a, a dashboard or a report generator that uh, displays uh, the generated insights, or you, you can steer uh, a web application, you can have a, some sort of data analytics calculation engine in, in an SAP uh, doing predictions of costs or whatever. And yeah, so that, that's the final application that ultimately leads to a business, business benefit and uh, allows you to succeed in such a case. Okay, so these are all the things that we have to consider and our what we strongly believe in is that we should consider this in a business cool way that we have to start from the top we should start thinking about what are the relevant use cases we have to identify that and specify it from that the, that would really if they work out uh, provide a benefit to the business and if you have them we can derive many requirements for the different levels maybe uh, what are the metrics for the algorithms or what do we have the, what kind of requirements we have on the platform but based on the use case. Now to see what should be done, I first want to tell you about a couple of projects where things didn't went well or weren't considered uh, good enough in this initial phase. And these were a project I was part of, so I will tell you about things that we didn't do properly. <laughs> and I will try to show you some use cases for the individual levels to see uh, what has to be considered there. And afterwards, we'll see now how we proceed in such a way that code base to do better. The first one, that's a, a plant manufacturer who plan to do uh, churn prediction for their service contracts. So they're saying, we sell a plant, we earn some money there, but we earn a lot of money with the service. But contract uh, competitors can take over this plant and provide the service as well. So they want to know which of the customers are very likely to jump off. I mean, that's classic term prediction that's used heavily in the telco industry, etc. Now, sounds like a good use case, and we start to, to get some data uh, from the SAP ERP system, uh, so about customers, contracts, etc. a lot of data, and they, they exported it from, uh, for us from the SAP, it took like four weeks to get all this data together, and then we started Data, analyzing it, predict, or building predict, uh, predictive models. We measured them and we've seen that we have very good scores, so it, it seems that that's something that we should go out of production. But it didn't. And the problem was is that they said we want to have weekly predictions. Uh, like every week we want to know uh, what are the most likely customers uh, to, to leave. And our models had a quite a heavy footprint on the entire data set. So what we needed is basically Every week we needed a, a, the most recent data set, but with also with all the, uh, the historic data. And it took them about four weeks to export. So there's absolutely no way to operationalize this outside of SAP. We would have to run it inside of SAP, but our model was way too complex to operationalize it in SAP. There was no SAP HANA in place or anything, so it was no way to run it. And I mean, this is really like dead on arrival. It doesn't matter how well you proceed in, your proof of concept, it's no way to operationalize it. Now I'm catastrophizing a bit, and of course this can lead to discussions about new data platforms, or uh, yeah, but you should consider this more important. We did this better in other projects where we considered this and had some restriction on the modeling space. We said like, okay, if you have to operationalize in SAP, we can implement linear functions here, so we restrict ourselves to general linear models, and we've seen logistic regression can be very successful in many cases. And we can use regularization and all these techniques outside for kind of like building the model uh, annually, but then you can run the predictions inside of SAP. So these considerations you have to do at the very beginning, not often after having spent a lot of time to build great predictive models which you cannot operationalize. All right, so that's data platform and data sources. 
Uh, another one on the algorithm level, that was Comparis a couple of years ago. Uh, we did a project, and Comparis is very good in giving recommendations on the regulated health insurance market. So all the products are the same there, and they can simply compare the prices and say, like, okay, that's, that's the most cheap one. The cheapest one, uh, probably that's the best one. Now in the supplementary health insurance market, it's much harder to compare the products. So one company says uh, you get 200 francs every two years, another side is at 400 francs every three years, so which one is better? And the other question is, which products do you actually need? You don't know, uh, maybe there's like 20, 25 different products out there, uh, alternative medicine, speed takes, but also things like auxiliary material, I don't even know what that means. So many, many people don't select anything because they have 25 checkboxes and most of them, like 80%, didn't select anything. Compilers wanted to do upselling and uh, give you better recommendation, only maybe present three boxes which uh, suit to your needs. So what did we do? We took their uh, usage uh, data, so uh, 20% that actually selected uh, uh, supplementary health entrances, and we did an unsupervised learning approach. We used a latent class uh, analysis, and we identified clusters in, in the data scene. Like there are different patterns of selecting things, kind of like teeth and strips and alternative medicine, kind of like as a group, and then speed ticks and other things together. And uh, we validated this, not a simple thing in, uh, in the unsupervised learning. Environment to, to validate and show that the models are, uh, are good enough. And it's not that easy to select the number of, of clusters, so there is, was quite some heavy mass in there to, to build these models. Then in the next steps, we went further and took the profiles of the customers, they had age, gender, where you live, and built a predictive model into which cluster you belong, and based on that, we were actually able to uh, do quite good uh, recommendations to the customers what health, supplementary health insurances would suit their needs. Now, we validated all this, I was very happy about the results, presented it, and I thought, that, okay, they're going to use that. But in the end, they pretty much dropped all this and went to a completely different approach, much, much simpler. The main problem was it was way too complex. So they said, so they didn't have a trust me model because they didn't understand it. They said, like, uh, it, it looks nice, but they didn't even understand properly the validation concept that we used. Um, they said, there's no way that we operationalize this. I mean, maybe we can implement it, but what happens next year is we retrain these models. How should we validate that things are going well or, or bad? We don't understand it. So I completely pursued the wrong target. I, I was convinced that I've done a great job. I mean, statistically, I did, but I pursued the wrong target. So it can be there can be very different targets in these fields. Sometimes it's really predictive power. The customer pays a lot of money to get the extra 0.1% in accuracy of a model. It can be. But often it's understandability, also to get the buy-in of the end users. If a sales guy has to visit customers based on his predictive model, and if he dis disagrees to the model, if this is a complete black box, he's going to be like, yeah, I'm not going to trust it. But if he's able to understand why the model is predicting this, he's much more likely to, to follow these advice. Another thing is, as you've seen, the operationalization and maintainability of the model that can be a, a key driver. This is also something that one can often see in the cattle competitions. There you have a, a, the goal is some metric, AUC score, accuracy, whatever it is in the competition. But the funding companies often do not select the, the winning uh, algorithm to operationalize it. And if the winning algorithm has a huge footprint and uses kind of like all available machine learning algorithms and using fancy ensemble stacking to, to build these models, it's just no way to operationalize it. So maybe they take a very simple one which has a similar performance, but it's much, much simpler. So it's important to know what are the targets, what are the key metrics, not just mathematically wise, but uh, also on a non-functional level. All right, and the last one, at the rather use case and application level, that's with a um, special vehicle manufacturer that did the project, and it was with a more internal uh, 
innovation department, and they tell us what they have is the customer call in, and they tell them, okay, uh, our special vehicle is making funny noises at the back, and it's not working properly anymore. Uh, please fix that. And the service technician goes there, takes a look at it, and they're like, oh, we need this spare part, additional wheel, whatever. Goes back, gets it, and goes back uh, on, on site to fix it. So they saw okay, it should be possible to predict what kind of material we need and directly take it to them. So this is the data. We built these models, and for me, really surprisingly, we were able to predict this quite well. Wow. Just based on this free text message on what they uh, described that the problem is, together with the structured information on what vehicles they have on site, actually, we were able quite well to predict what material is needed. So presented this, the customer is very happy, and then we went to the actual end users, the people from the service business. And when they saw this, they were like, oh, okay, no, that's, that's not what we need. These two things, we're anyway doing this. It's not as described in the process, but we always take this with us. And these things we can't take with us because we have to order it first. So it doesn't make sense to wait and order first. So there were many flaws from the use case side why the thing that we pursued was the wrong thing. And th that was really uh, a thing that we should have talked much more clearly with the end users about what, what are they planning to do, what do they need. And that was missed in this program. All right, so now we talked a lot about things that went wrong or we didn't consider properly. Uh, let's have a look on what we, what we try to do now currently uh, to do these things better and consider these things uh, earlier. So this is the <coughs> left top corner of the data analytics process. That's the vision and scope phase. And we have these three main uh, elements in here. And the first one, Let's start with the, the business full uh, approach. It's really the idea generation, the ideation, and we do this with the business. So that's not an R&D internal thing where you think about what the business potentially could use. This is really investigating business value chain, etc., to figure out what could potentially be done. We normally do this uh, in, in workshops, and this is closely aligned, this approach to the design thinking. Where you first think about the problems that you have, you pretty much open up the problem space, and you see like, what are all the problems, and then you consolidate and figure out what are the main problems you want to focus on, and then you open up the solution space and finally decide on certain solutions that you want to try to implement. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to go through uh, different methodologies how you can do this in workshops. Maybe just one example would be here the, the jobs to be done analysis where we really focus on, on, on the jobs, they call it the job, and not on the task that they're doing. So the jobs means what they actually uh, want to do in the end. So one a silly example is uh, with lawnmowers. So the Glas and Mayer, the company sells lawnmowers. They can say like, well, what our customers want to do, they want to cut grass. But that's not actually the job they want to do. What do they actually want? They want to have, let's say, the grass, keep it low at all times and beautiful at all times. This is the job they want to achieve. And you could potentially do it by uh, using a lawnmower. But the company could also think about, uh, I don't know, genetically modify grass that don't, doesn't grow above a certain level or some completely different approach. So here it's about what are the jobs and then you can see which jobs are already uh, satisfied very well by the existing solutions and where do you have jobs which are not satisfied, or maybe you need like three different tools to do it. This is, this is also a good indication that something is not satisfied properly. So that's really about what does the business do and what do they need. This is also not about data analytics. So here, we don't talk about data analytics at all. Of course, often things pop up, but here it's really about the business problem and not about the solution. Now on this side, that's much more about data analytics. That's much like data analytics is a potential solution to a problem. But it potentially is not the only one. And this is also why in these workshops, we often staff it uh, very, with an interdisciplinary team. So maybe bringing user experience experts, software architects, etc., into such a workshop to take different solution approach to, uh, to a problem. I mean, one example was 
then we had to request an actual request from a customer that they want to have a chatbot on their web page to help the customer to fill in the form. So they had problems, people didn't were, uh, weren't able to manage to, to fill in the things properly, so they said, like, oh, we need a chatbot to do that. And I mean, I'd like to do that chatbot, the <laughs> fun part for the data scientists, but is that the right solution approach? Isn't it rather a, a user experience problem, or aren't there different approaches to solve this? So that's, here it's about a business problem, and here potentially data analytics is a solution. All right, so here we bring up many, many ideas. And then in the sec next step, we somehow have to rate them, rank them according to some criteria. Uh, what is your maturity? Uh, maturity, in, uh, for example, are you, can you easily operationalize things like this, or is it completely new? What's the business benefit, etc. So there are different criteria to figure out uh, what are your, your most important use cases. And you should also consider uh, not only single use cases, but also think about some sort of roadmap. Say that, okay, certain use cases we can already start operationalizing or pursuing them now, but other ones maybe need some work on a completely different level. Maybe you need uh, changes in your data platform, you need some sort of data lake to incorporate many data sources. Uh, maybe you have some organizational topics, you said that we need to uh, hire new resources, etc. So here you should consider kind of like the uh, higher scope. And then the last level, the last step is if you want to now pursue one use case, we we try to force the customer to refine this use case in more detail before we go into, uh, in, into the actual development solution. So what is, it, is this about? This is just one example artifact one can use that's kind of like a business case one pager. Uh, it's in German here, so it's the use case Steckbrief, and it's just exemplified for uh, the case of predictive maintenance. So maybe you can't read it properly, I walk you through to the main elements. At the very top left corner, it's just a description of the use case. So what is the actual problem you're trying to solve? What's the solution approach? Um, what's the product vision and who's gonna be the user? So how, how's that gonna look like? And what are the key metrics, uh, the targets? So how do we measure the success of this solution? Really from the business side, uh, that you really think about this and specify this very early. Then you have uh, kind of like the key assumptions to be tested. It's pretty much a backlog for evaluating the prototype, but um, here you should really specify this on different levels. So one thing could be, um, okay, is there enough signal in the data to predict failures on our machinery? That's kind of like the, on the, the data and modeling side. Another one could be, uh, is the service business actually benefiting from uh, such predictions? I mean, these are this is a strong assumptions that, well, if you can predict the failure, are we reducing costs? How? Uh, are we earning more money? Well, how are we going to earn money here? So that's an assumption you should definitely check before you start investing a lot of money. So that's really on different levels, uh, data platform buys, etc. You can specify the assumptions. And then there are three more boxes where we try to quantify the, the benefits of a use case. One is the strategical fit, so you look into the strategy of your company, does the use case fit into this? One is uh, a very, very rough, simplified uh, business case calculation, and this one is about the risks, so specifying the risks and putting some numbers on it. And in the end, there is some uh, function that calculates out of all these numbers a final score for a use case, that based on which you potentially could rank um, use court cases uh, and, and, and measure. But we never ever use this to select use cases, and it's much less about the actual numbers that are here, but it's more about that you think about all these topics. Especially here, the business benefit. It's very important to think about what's the profit mechanism. Are we reducing costs somewhere? Are we earning more money? What approximately will be the costs, etc.? And not to, to put the exact right numbers in but that you put thoughts in it, how are we going to earn money with this uh, if we have successfully built it? If it works out very well, um, in some cases you can really operationalize this 
uh, profit mechanism and provide kind of like a function which allows us after evaluating the prototype to measure is the model good enough or not. So that could be for predict maintenance in a very, very simplified way. You could say that while we have uh, 200 units out there, uh, we have approximately 1,000 failures per year, so we have a daily failure rate of 0.1%. And then what are the costs of the failure? I put here 5,000 francs, but that's something very important that the, the business thinks about. What happens? Uh, how much does it cost us if we have a failure? And how much could we save if we prevent this? Um, how much does it cost if a service technician goes on site if there is no failure? And now if we have this information, you can put in the numbers from evaluate the prototype and your, uh, from your model, so the false positive rate, 1%. So if there is no failure, there's 1% that you predict the failure, and the true positive rate of 40%, so if there is a failure, we detect it with like almost, uh, almost half of all the failures we can detect. So that looks very nice, modeling-wise, but if you put it in here and say, like, okay, let's do daily predictions, we would have more costs from the unnecessary uh, service technician visits than we would have from preventing the failures. Without even considering the cost of the entire project, this business case wouldn't hold just by uh, the, the, the means that you have to, uh, to, uh, to use the prediction. And if you would have, of course, if you put in here, you have a uh, cost of 50,000 francs of the failure, this would work out very well. So it's very, very important to, to think about uh, what will we do and what will we save or how much money will we earn. All right, so these are things um, one should think about beforehand, such that we know what do we have to optimize for. And only after that, one should start looking at the data and doing all the fun part of it here. Now, to conclude, of course, every customer and every project is different, and uh, you are often meeting a customer at a different place. The customer wants to do uh, Churn prediction has very clear ideas about the use case. You can't go there and tell them, okay, uh, first you have to do an ideation workshop and uh, start from the very beginning. Of course, no. But I would really suge suggest also, if you're working internally in a company as a data scientist, that before you go into doing this analysis of the data, that you think very clearly about what the use case is and what are all the different aspects that should be considered, such that you're not spend a lot of time, your precious time from the title, uh, just to figure it out like here that you pursued the completely wrong targets or built something that could never be operational.